Hi and welcome to Inspiration's International Women's Day special where we celebrate women in business and the arts. On today's show we feature some amazing women from across the globe including blogging entrepreneur Louisa Clare, Korea's first astronaut Dr. So Young Yi, the musical stars from A Chorus Line, mindset mentor Jenny Brown, London designer Mei Wei Lu and many more. I hope you enjoy the show and be inspired. Pioneer of Australian style, an internationally renowned artist and designer, joins us at the NGV at her fabulous art exhibition, Bush Couture. Thank you so much for joining us today, Linda. Oh, thank you. So what is Bush Couture? It just seemed to make sense that I called it bush couture because it was the bush that inspired me. And couture means to cut. Yes. So it was cutting up the bush to make all these exquisite gowns. So you started off as a fashion designer and um, actually Anna Piaggi, the former editor of Vogue Italia, sort of pick, picked you up and all co saw your movement as being something that was coming from, a, a, I guess, a hemisphere away from Italy and really put you on the map. That actually was when Jenny and I took a collection. Yes. Eleven trunks. We yeah. went to Milan, Paris and New York mm -hmm. with a government development export grant. Uh -huh. And of course we were a sensation. After you returned from a triumphant season in Europe, um, how did you sort of segue from fashion design into creating um, amazing artworks? The first dress for the first show that we did at the Hingara restaurant that was in Chinatown in mm -hmm. 19... 74 was the Opera House dress because the Opera House had just opened and I was inspired to make something that reflected that even though it was such a simple shape really the Opera House mm -hmm. it's still how was I going to portray that and it was a really great experiment in making do with the elements that you have around you plus the textiles that you could get and how could you do mm. it and how could you turn something into an art piece as well. Mm. Um, do you think that there is something that Australia designers bring to the design and art scene that no one else can? Well I think growing up and living in this wonderful beautiful country that's what inspired me but I know now with younger designers it's, so, it's quite different because they have the whole world at their feet, people travel a lot more, you're on the internet, you can see what's going on around the world, it's become much more generic so if you want to be different you have to work out how am I going to be mm. different. You originally are from Melbourne but you have been living for a long time in far north Queensland and working with um, Indigenous people. How has that influenced your work um, and you personally? Well I started being interested in, in the Indigenous communities and the women and their textiles in the 70s and that's I think we can see the piece behind us, that's the Utopia mm. one there. So that was 1980, that's very early of having that interest and over the years I've spent a lot of time in Alice Springs, Arnhem Land, workshops with printing and painting and textiles and more recently I've been up in far north Queensland. Moving on to your exhibition, um, can you explain to us how this came about and um, the retrospective of your work? Well the NGV has had a collection from, of some of my work from 1983, I think one of the first pieces that came into the collection and over the years the odd piece came in and in 1992 a little, another handful of pieces came into the collection and because I'm from Melbourne I wanted to in the most recent years working on my archives and photographing them and documenting them we started to have discussions with the curators here about maybe more coming into the collection to start this year off with this exhibition which just looks so fantastic in here so exciting is like wow it's fabulous it's an amazing lifetime achievement. I think when you walk around and see your work, you can't help but being um, taken away with all the details, the colours, and the workmanship that has gone into everything that you do. So what's next for you? Well, more a bit more archiving with the pieces that are in the collection, but I've had ideas about some books, and which I'm working on now, and illustrated books, and going through all my photographs, along with painting in between working on some new digital prints and things like that. Thank you very much for joining well, us. Thank you very much for coming in to this 
wonderful colourful room. <laughs> Next, Karen Kim meets Korea's first astronaut, Dr. So Young Yi. At the time, I dreamed about to be an astronaut, but it was just a dream. On the 8th of April 2008, Dr. So Young Yi became the first Korean astronaut to be launched into space. And Korea became the third country in the world to launch a woman into space. Just fantastic. Dr. So Young Yi, <laughs> welcome to Inspiration. Thank you, thank you. When was the first time mm -hmm. that you decided, I am going to be an astronaut? Oh, frankly speaking, when I watched animation or movie, maybe around three year old, five year old kids, and at the time I dreamed about to be an astronaut, but it was just a dream. I mean, in 69, mm -hmm. when man first mm -hmm. landed on the moon, mm -hmm. I mean, Korea was just not in the position yeah, to yeah. even imagine. imagine. Yeah. Even we cannot feed ourselves at all at the time. Yeah, after 20 years, finally they made the first satellite. Of course, comparing with Russia, well, America is too small, but I think we made a huge development. Now, with um, the science of mm -hmm. space engineering, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a very male-dominated industry, yeah, isn't right. it? <laughs> well, they even sent Laker, the dog, yeah, right. up to space before the first woman. What's going on? Yeah, right. <laughs> so how much do you think the industry is actually changing? And what uh -huh. can you, perhaps, as an ambassador? Of course, so many engineering fields are dominated by guys, but mm -hmm. it's not guys' fault. We should be responsible for that as a woman also because sometimes even before studying, even before attempting, we just stuck inside of bias. Maybe I cannot make it because I'm a woman. That point is the really big mistake, I think. So we really have to change our mindset. Yeah, really, yeah. And, and so, believe that the impossible yeah, is before, possible. Before changing guys, we should be changed first. And we, we'd better do our best. Later, we'd better complain. I think as long as we women mm -hmm. are the ones that can give birth mm -hmm. and men can't, mm -hmm. we often have to give sacrifices mm -hmm. in order to um, really achieve and keep up with the men. Yeah, right. Have you found that you have had to make a lot of sacrifices along the way? Uh, I don't think so, but sometimes I feel like I'm so greedy because <laughs> so many people think I sacrificed for something, but in the same time, I want to make that for my own life also. I understand family pressure. Yeah, right. <laughs> Does your mum constantly berate you and nag you to have uh, children and get married? I have a very interesting background, actually. I got a PhD, but my mom even couldn't go to the middle school. So my ironic. mom has a, those kind of sad story. And so she decided after that, I shouldn't make my daughter like that. Korea mm -hmm. would want to send a man of course but even I knew that so at the back of your mind you were hoping yeah of course of, of course, course. And, and so how did you feel yeah right when it so happened? at the time my thought is like even though I will not fly I should do my best not to regret later that's right and then just tell me what was running through your mind when you heard mm -hmm. that he was going to go home mm -hmm. and uh, you were going to take his Place. Uh, so many people suggest that our, I would be so happy but totally opposite mm -hmm. because at the time I feel really huge pressure from the Korean public. Mm -hmm. So if I will make a mistake, it's not Soyeon's mistake, it's a woman's mistake. That's so right. it's did very you find tricky. a lot of pressure from the men? Were they supportive or did they put you down? Both of them, everywhere. <laughs> everywhere some guys are supporters. I think I was so lucky. All my colleagues and all my friends are very supportive, even though I'm an only woman. And you spent 10 days, mm -hmm. 21 hours, yeah. <laughs> in a fairly confined space with yeah. two cosmonauts. Mm -hmm. Now, spending with, time with anyone for that amount of time is bad enough, but how, yeah. how was it? So I go up with two guys and then switch it and then should get back with the different two guys. So it's very interesting, mm. but or they had a training together in same training center mm -hmm. and then all they uh, have a same kind of destiny because it's very fragile and dangerous place yes 
so I couldn't feel any uncomfortability here. And you took some little friends up with you, a thousand mm -hmm. fruit flies. I had a really serious motion sickness, but I cannot blame anybody because I applied. Mm -hmm. but fruit flies, they cannot do that. So. Did they survive the mission? Yeah, survived. And then they kindly sacrificed for our experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we want to check several DNA kind of things and then we want to check their behavior mm -hmm. what's the difference between on the earth and in their space so. now you are quite a celebrity in Korea of course now after this historical mission uh -huh. of yours mm -hmm. how has life changed since you've been up in space oh totally changed it mm -hmm. I can tell yeah when I applied astronaut program I couldn't imagine that I can be famous I was stupid actually <laughs> at the time I just thought about space experiment in the space maybe it will be cool so mm -hmm. I couldn't prepare anything at all for being famous but to do that you should pay back mm -hmm. because there's nothing for free in the world I think that's right. so so All many balance. kids shouldn't know that yeah that's right but for me and mm -hmm. for many of our viewers mm -hmm. You are an absolute inspiration and thank oh, you so thank much you. for sharing you. your story with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Today on Inspiration, we're at the Royal Melbourne Golf Club at the Hunter Australian Open and we're going to be getting some tips on how to improve our golf swing. We're now talking with Julia Sergis, one of the professional golfers. Thanks so much for joining us. You just you. got off the tee. How did you go? I played quite well, thank you. Yeah, it's a beautiful course, but it's quite tough, so I shoot well today. What are the qualities you think you need to have to be a good golfer? I think you just have to stay patient because it's a lot of golf shots out there and it's a long day and you need to have passion for what you do no matter what it is, if it's golf or it's your job and uh, when you have passion you find a way to make things work. If you don't have the self-discipline and motivation, you've got to be paying someone a lot of money to get you to do it. <laughs> and what advice would you give to someone that's never played golf before and they just wanted to start? How would they start? Um, Start by having fun, you know, if you don't like it, then, you know, you can't spend as many hours as you do out there practicing, so you got to make sure to have fun. Yeah, go get out there and play. I mean, it's, some people say, oh, well, growing up for me, a lot of people said, oh, golf, that's such an old man's sport, you know, and the girls don't play golf. But you've just, you just got to get out there and do it. Do you think that there's any um, pressure or is anything different being a golfer as a woman? Um, I think that we are a little behind, you know, obviously we're always, the ladies tour is trying to find more sponsors and just get a bigger name for itself. Yeah, and we're playing exactly the same golf course the men have played years for years and years and spectators will come out and see it and think, wow, these women can actually play as good as the men, I'm going to support it a little bit more. And it's easier for spectators to relate to us as well. Is it important that the prize money is so big for a tournament like this? I think it helps, you know, it helps uh, attract more people. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. You. Grazie mille. Grazie a voi. <laughs> Today we're with Jenny Brown, motivator, property investment expert, author, and someone who's passionate about helping people get what they want. Thank you so much for joining us, Jenny. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> At 30, you were divorced, broke, had serious health issues. Can you tell us about your story and how you overcame that and became the successful person you are today? As you just uh, said, I was not living in very good circumstances and really I, I had to make a choice, Katrina, about my life. So the choice that I made was that I wanted to not only live but live really, really well. So I started uh, again from scratch pretty much. My dad had been my mentor as a mm -hmm. child. He taught me property investing and so I used that to uh, put myself back on uh, even keel financially. I bought a, a block of land, mm -hmm. everyone said I was nuts, built a house, I sold it a couple of years later, had enough money uh, to quit my job and to have the choice of never having to actually go and physically work for someone again. And from there I've just gone from strength to strength. 
inspirational story and how did you get into helping others achieve the kind of success that you have? What happened with the property investing was that I didn't realise how much knowledge I had and how successful I actually was with it. And over time I was being asked to speak uh, at other people's events and to educate other people and mentor them on property and I, I actually resisted that for a long time because I didn't really think I had that knowledge or that right or anything like that. But I stood on a stage uh, one day and I saw the significant impact it had on people and how motivating it was for them to see that they could actually do something, they could actually change their lives, that it was inspiring for them to see someone actually doing what they wanted to do and to have that life that they were dreaming of. So from there I started speaking, I started running my own events and they were predominantly about property. Uh, but then I started working with my high-end clients and that was all about mindset and getting them to focus on their lives and what they wanted and so now that's where I'm focusing uh, on helping people to work out what they really want out of life and it could be wealth, it could be success, it could just be simply being a great parent and uh, helping them to, to find a path towards that and it's really, really rewarding. What do you think the tools people need to become successful and live the life that they've always dreamed of, whether it is being a great parent or being a millionaire? For me there's a number of steps in this process but the very very first thing that people need to identify is why they're on this earth, what it is that they really want, what their big dreams are. Um, most people don't dare to dream or we haven't knocked out of us while we're going through life or life gets in the way, you know, you may have children or a job and you sort of get stuck in that mm. comfort. I've got this saying, it's either comfort or your dream. Mm. You can't be comfortable and have your dream because having a dream means that you lose that comfort zone. Do you think that people are often struggling with fear and limits that they construct in their mind themselves? I believe there are two main fears that people have. Mm -hmm. The first fear is the fear, fear of failure. You know, they're scared to have a go because they think they might fail, their friends might judge them, or they might lose some money, or, or you know, some sort of fear. But I also think there's another fear, and that's the fear of success. Mm. People are scared of being successful. They're scared of what that will look like. Often people who step out and, you know, work towards achieving something that's a little bit unusual or different, uh, you know, we, we are unique individuals, we look extraordinary to people. I think I'm an ordinary everyday person, but to most people I know now that they view me as extraordinary and unique and different. And I think that that's a big fear of people that they will be viewed as unique or different and not normal. And so they, they are challenged by the fact that if they really are successful, then are they going to be ostracised or put down or you know lose maybe their friends or support network or what will happen to their lives if that actually happens. And then it's just helping people work through those two things so they can get and live their dream, get what they want and live their dream. For me the process of, of identifying dreams and, and helping people to facilitate that process within themselves is not even about facing your fears or identifying what they are, for me it's about identifying what the dream is, mm. identifying what your goals are, and then following that process through. So really we don't look at the fears, we just put it aside, and we focus on what it is that we really want and how we're going to get there. So more a positive path. Can anybody be successful? Yes, absolutely. I think it's your definition of success. For me, success is to be um, a property investing expert. It's to be someone who helps people and, and has a philanthropic bent. That's my personal success story, and it's my personal success goal. Mm but yours may be something different. So, you know, success to, to different people means different things. It may be something very simple, like being the most amazing mother. It may be something phenomenal, like Mother Teresa. So I think success is totally different for different people and we need to keep that in mind when we're looking at what it is that we want to do. Not to judge ourselves by what society says is successful, but to judge ourselves by what it is that we are here to do. Have you got some success stories that you can tell us about? Somebody that really stands out that you've mentored along the way? I have a client at the moment, her name is Kelly, she lives in Brisbane and last year she decided that one of her goals for last year would be to achieve uh, a directorship on the Australian Compliance Board, which is Australasian Compliance Board, which is no mean feat. Yeah. Another client of mine, Kathy, attended a property seminar that I was running a few years ago and Kathy decided that she wanted to 
uh, get her family out of debt and that she wanted to stay home with her children. She had two small children. And so she set out and within a year, this is the most amazing story and I get goosebumps when I think about it. Within a year, very deliberately, they had uh, reduced their own personal mortgage, and I say they because her husband was involved, uh, to, to almost zero and uh, cleared over $400,000 worth of debt, set themselves up to be ready to uh, reinvest and, and secure their future. And she was also able to resign from her position and stay home with her children. What's next for you? Some of the, the plans I have this year is I take my clients, uh, just a small group of 10, on what's called a wealth retreat overseas. Mm -hmm. And um, we go for about a week, it's five star mm -hmm. all the way. This year we've got uh, some plans to go to mm -hmm. Africa and Cambodia, mm -hmm. and we'll just keep planning them from there. I try to go to a different country each time. So the last one was in Vietnam, and that was a phenomenal experience. But my main goal, uh, Katrina, is to help as many people as possible to achieve the dreams that they have and, mm -hmm. and celebrate their successes with them. There's nothing better, more inspiring for me than to, to watch that happen. Thank you so much for joining us, Jenny, and good luck with helping others. Thank you. <laughs> Truly inspiring. Thank you. Today on Inspiration, I'm speaking with Alex Leahy, emerging star from the band Animo. Alex, welcome to the show. Hi Karen, thanks for having me. On. Now you are quite a talent. You're in a band called Animo, which is a septet and has been described as the love child of funk, soul, pop and jazz. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We sort of get a whole lot of genres in our sound, which is pretty cool. And you've even been likened to the Cat Empire, which is one of my favourite bands. Oh, by some, it's very... Um, yeah, it's very flattering to be like into a band like that. They're just so talented and so established and amazing all over the world. Alex, you've just finished BCE, right? Yeah, I finished my um, uh, IB diploma in 2010. So this, I'm just starting my second year out of high school now. And uh, I'm also starting my second year of my uh, music arts double degree at Monash, mm -hmm. where I'm studying um, saxophone and majoring in international studies as a part of my arts degree. So music isn't necessarily the uh, the one and only goal that you have in life, is that right? Oh, I think it is like my major goal in my life, but I also kind of didn't want to shut my academic life off completely because I really enjoy just learning more about the world and about, um, you know, the way we society works and that sort of thing. It's another one of my interests, but music is definitely my priority at this point. So international studies as a backup? Yeah, maybe. Who knows, it might be like a delegate of the UN or something like Terrific. that one day. I think the way to world peace is probably music anyway. But <laughs> <laughs> I actually heard of your band initially at uh, the local Battle of the Bands and I think you were an absolute standout. Oh, thank you very much. Tell us a bit about your band. Um, well, the seven of us all met um, at high school in the, lo in, the, um, in the high school big band. And then when the majority of us finished high school, we didn't really want it to be the end of our music life together, let alone our schooling life. So um, myself and uh, our tenor saxophone player, Ollie Whitehead, sent out this email to another um, five of the guys uh, who were in the big band, sort of saying, oh, you know, like, we really want to keep on playing together. We don't know about you guys, but we certainly do. And we want to um, create a really accessible band. And then we just had a unanimous yes from all the guys that we emailed. And, um, you know, from there, Animo was born. And we've kind of developed into uh, this you know, melting pot of genres, which wasn't necessarily the intention at the start, um, but... It just sort of evolved It's that way. just kind of evolved and it's been very natural and not very forced and I think we're all very happy with the way it's turned out so far. It's you know, like one big jam session, isn't it? Yeah, That's absolutely. Something. Yeah, so, you know, we'll just see what happens and where it takes us. Now, I couldn't help but notice that you are the only girl amongst yeah. six handsome young men. Now, how, how is that working with um, six guys on a pretty much full-time basis? Uh, they're all great. Like, they, they all bring their own, um, you know, personality to the table and they're not, you know, all influenced by one another. They're very much all their own person and great people at that. Um, I really, really enjoy working with them. You're about to release your first, is it your first EP? No, we've released our first EP already. This is our first um, it's kind of our first independent single. We've already released it on um, Triple J on Earth. So mm, can you tell our viewers a bit about the, the song that you're about to release? Yeah, well, Song for Grace is um, it's not about a person called Grace, mm -hmm. um, as some people might think. 
It's rather about um, the elegance with which we go about our actions and sometimes that it's compromised when we make poor decisions and we don't trust our judgement. Wow, I'm really blown away no. by that actually. <laughs> so um, you've actually been touring quite a bit with um, big name bands, bands that have been around for a long time. Yeah. Well, and you've got a regular gig. I mean, this is just out of high school and what, what do your parents think of this and your peers? I think, um, I think everyone's a bit... Um, taken aback by the amount of work we're putting in. I mean, last year alone, which was our first year of, um, you know, of working together, we did uh, over 50 gigs um, on top of, um, you know, a whole lot of other really cool shows that we, were, you know, we were able to be a part of. We did, um, we toured around Victoria with Stonefield, who, and that was just after they came back from playing Glastonbury. And so we did a three, three date tour with them, which was really fun. And you know, to sort of be you know, saying, oh, you know, we just want a local battle of the bands. And then they're like, yeah, we were just doing a festival with Beyonce. It was kind of, you know... It's just phenomenal. Oh, it's ridiculous. There are a lot of teenage bands out there that um, are obviously really trying to, to make yeah. it, and they would look up to you as uh, their role models. Have you got any advice for them? Um, the best advice I've ever been given came from a family friend of ours who um, used to play bass for Paul Kelly. Mm -hmm. And his advice was to make sure that you're able to read music. I think that that's something that gets sort of looked past by a lot of young musicians, just sort of thinking, you know, you're able to play your, you know, you know, you are able to play a million songs with just knowing four chords on guitar, but you can't really sustain a career. I think also another thing that um, I really urge young musicians to um, to start doing is really get in touch with the industry, start connecting, start networking, um, start sort of, you know, seeing who's up and coming and seeing who you can sort of, um, you know, get in contact with and maybe tee up a gig with because you never mm. know what's going to happen. I'm How old are you now? I'm 19. 19. For a 19 year old, you really have your head screwed on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Amazing. And I think you're a real inspiration, not just for um, up and coming young teenage rockers, but uh, for um, mums like me <laughs> and um, many other women out there. So thank you so much for joining us oh, today. Thanks so much for having me, Karen. Thank really you. Inspiration. If you would like any more information on any of the tips or segments you've seen on today's show, please go to our website, inspirationalwomen.tv. We're now across to London Fashion Week with Mei Wei Lu. My name is Mei Hui Liu. I'm originally from Taiwan. I've lived in East London since 1998. I started my fashion label here, Victim Fashion Street. The concept of my design is to make recycled vintage dresses. I use many different fabrics from different periods to make the style modern. At the moment, I'm working on my next collection for London Fashion Week, February 2012. It will be an installation in the special ethical fashion zone. I'm collaborating with a Taiwanese illustrator, Mingzi, for an art project called Interlace 51 degrees north, 0 degrees west. These are the geographic coordinates of London where all my inspiration and influence come from. And lace is my signature style. I call it interlace because it represents the interaction between myself and Min Su, and also with the three subjects of the installation. The first is Diane Panet, who is a famous fashion critic in Paris. Her signature style is very chic and strong, but always in black, which is why I call this piece Lady in Black. The second is colorful lady Sue Kreitzman, an artist from East London. Her style is always very colorful and playful. I've known both this eccentric, and passionate women for more than 10 years.
The third subject is about my daughter Freya, who just turned one year old. Her piece is called Freya's Wonderland. It combines my childhood with her childhood, using two Victorian dresses which you cradle each other. Many, many patchwork bows and ribbons are made of two kinds of fabrics. Vintage fabrics collect over the years, each with story of its own. Other fabrics are brand new, which means illustrated. My gypsy childhood and Fair's childhood adventures are blended together. It's a celebration of a friendship and motherhood. Working on this project is a challenge for me because it's a bridge between my background in fashion and a new future in art. And I'm hoping that it will help my visual language evolve. Today we're with Louisa Clare who turned her successful blog into a successful blog matchmaking business. Thank you so much for joining us. So what encouraged you to um, start a blog in the first place? I started my blog after I moved to Melbourne from Sydney, just as a way to keep in touch with family and friends back home. No idea that it was going to lead me down the path that's taken. Why do people read your blogs rather than someone else's? A blog is a, is a story and it's a it's a really personal thing. So people choose the blogs they read based on how well they connect with that person, whether they um, engage with the way that person thinks, whether that person provides them with practical advice as a parent, whether it's a craft thing, whether they want beauty tips. People are looking for information online and that's why people read blogs. And what companies have you worked with before? did quite a few events with Kellogg's last year and with Garnier, but I've also worked with smaller uh, home-based businesses such as Itty Bitty Greenie. So every end of the spectrum. And why would they use a service like you, your blog outreach, rather than doing it themselves? I think one of the real strengths of what Brand Meets Blog does is that we are bloggers ourselves. So uh, I'm a blogger, I know where bloggers are, and that means that you're getting people who have that other side of the, the picture and who can find those natural advocates for you. Uh, and that's certainly what I'm passionate about doing. And what sort of companies would use your service for um, blog outreach? Companies who are wanting to run targeted campaigns, who are wanting to bring together bloggers or individuals who have a real interest in who they are and what they do. That's my specialty, that's what I love. I love organic conversation where you're bringing together people who can really naturally and honestly and authentically um, share a story that, that, is a, that is a shared story. Thank you ladies so much for joining us in this forum about mummy bloggers. So you're, you're all mummy bloggers and how did you get started and um, what encouraged you to be bloggers? For me it was probably a bit different to everyone else because I run a business and so I got into it through it being I guess another marketing tool for my business. Um, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter and, and blogging just allows you another opportunity to, so I guess, promote what you do and, um, and, and, and draw in the, the readership and hopefully the clientele. I started blogging about six years ago as a way to share more with friends that I'd met online in parenting forums and digital scrapbooking and then I decided I actually quite enjoyed writing and I had things I wanted to share and actually, strangely enough, people wanted to read it so it's gone from there. One of the main things with um, blogging is that it allows you to really um, optimise your search engine um, uh, results mm -hmm. um, because the main thing for business is that the content is always changing on your site to, to make people find you and make Google like you a lot and a blog really enables that because you can constantly be putting new and different information on there with like little keywords scattered through mm -hmm. and a lot of the time people will find that um, more often than they might actually find my site but then they get directed through uh -huh. so that's one thing and you talk about different products that you like and that you use like for example nappies or milk formula and then then say for example someone types in what's the best milk and then you, you have reviewed it is that right yeah so that's 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 exactly how yeah. you would um, you know title it and maybe use a few keywords throughout the blog yeah. 
um, you want to use words that people are searching for on you know on Google um, for me it's because I my business is helping mums in business I do a lot of reviews of business books and business products and business services and of course um, you know title them the same way you know how do you find a really good uh, business accountant and hopefully they'll find that when they search and what advice do you give um, mothers or mummy bloggers who want to um, start businesses I think a lot of the time, the first year, you can't actually think of as a year in business. It's more of a year of learning yeah. how to run a business. Fantastic. And have you used your blog to move into the business arena as well? Um, not really. My blog's a fairly personal blog. I do do some PR commitment. I have some PR mm -hmm. commitments and I write some sponsored posts. But primarily I blog because I enjoy it, because I've got something to say, ideas to share, and I want to interact with other people. And I live in a rural community and I have four small children sometimes it's not so easy to get out there and go to things and meet people but with your blog you can interact and communicate with a large number of people from a lot of different places and mostly I've made friends and I've learnt new things and it's stretched me as a person and that's really why I blog more than anything else. It sounds all positive, is there any drawbacks from having blogs? I think, well the, as my children have gotten older one thing I've become more aware of is what I'm sharing of them, that's their story as opposed to my story. My girls are eight now. When they were little, it didn't seem such a big deal to share all the terrible things they did as toddlers. But now that they're eight, I'm more aware of what I'm putting out there of theirs, and I'm more aware of privacy issues and things like that. But I think everybody deals with that in their own way, um, and everybody has different comfort levels. And what do you think the greatest thing personally you've got that you've got from writing a blog? This. You know, but we did, we had dinner last week and, and we have play dates, yeah. it's, it's the excellent. Met and the things that I've learned, and I've done things that I would never dream that I would ever think that I would. Great, thank you so much for your insights on blogging. We now cross to Karen Kim, who interviews the dedicated women behind the International Women's Development Agency. Today on Inspiration, I have with me two very important women from the International Women's Development Agency. Joanna Hayter, the current Executive Director, and on my far left, Wendy Poussard, the original founding member. Welcome. Tell me about the International Women's Development Agency, or we'll call it IWDA. How does it differ and uh, what is its main focus? I think IWDA is really quite distinctive actually, Karen. Mm -hmm. I think what's really exciting is that we're the only Australian agency, non-government agency, that's working in international development in, with a complete focus on gender equality and women's rights. And one of our key objectives in, in leading as the Women's Development Agency is to be sure that we understand all of those complexities around poverty. Because poverty is not just an absence of money, it's not the image of the poor, poor child or, or the struggling person that we see. We're talking about human dignity, human respect, we're talking about justice and equal opportunities for everybody. Could you describe one particular project that you've done recently? About a month ago I was travelling in Timor-Leste and was involved with a rural women's exchange. In that exchange what we did was with three or four trucks and about 60 women, we brought together women from multiple villages that had not met each other before but had very, very similar stories in life in terms of wanting to increase their own domestic income, cash income and wanting to find new ways to work together in terms of business and entrepreneurship. But bringing all of those women together, a whole lot of things happened. One, people met each other for the first time. Two, it was extraordinary to see those stories of exchange, how similar people's issues and challenges and priorities and senses of humour and 
kind of visions and dreams were. There was quite a lot of similarity around that. Three, there was, um, a, it was very clear there was a very traditional sense at the village level in Timor-Leste about what work women could do for money. It's funny that when you talk about the communities and getting women who don't really know each other together and talking about their issues they have and how to make um, their own cash flow, mm. that could be anywhere. That could be inner city Melbourne, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> and it, it, those sort of programs I can see now that you're saying it actually can work and be implemented in, in any society. Absolutely. And voices and choices. You know, equality in human rights is around voices and choices that we all, regardless of our gender, we all have the choice to live lives as we choose and we should live in a way that protects us, enables us to, to be who we want. I Do you think there are different strengths and weaknesses perhaps. that women in the workforce bring to the table that um, perhaps in our makeup or our characteristics that are different to men? I think the strength here is that we, because we're really talking about women's issues, about particular issues or problems or inequalities in the world that affect women, um, women have a, a common interest in that. We can empathise so and that, with that. Well, we're, sure. we're in it's it. I mean, experience. it happens to us. It's our experience mm. as well. And I think that, you know, my experience, both internationally and nationally, is centred by my experience as a woman. And so I think when the opportunity came along, IWGA, beautifully at the start of its next generation, its 26th year of operation. But I think, you know, when that chance came along, I thought, yes, absolutely, that's it. You know, join in. We need more women leaders in the development space if we're really going to get parity and equality in relation to how you resource our international relations in the context of development and aid. That has to have an equal lens in terms of men and women. To see over the past 20, 26 years, things mm. are definitely moving, yeah. but as you say, it's a it's a step-by-step -step process. You can't change thousands of years of culture overnight. I just wish we could meet the demand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Wendy Karen. And Joe. Thanks, Karen. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jenny Brown. Have you ever wondered why some people achieve extraordinary success in their lives and yet others just seem to live very boring, mundane lives? A recent study of Harvard Business graduates showed that those who had clear, written goals achieved huge success in their lives, whilst those who didn't write their goals down achieved little or no success. The benefit of taking some time, just a few small minutes each day to write your goals down will significantly impact your life and you will find that you will achieve your goals very, very quickly. If you too would like to achieve extraordinary results with your life, then get in touch with us at www.jennybrownevents.com. Thank you. We now go out and about and meet the performers at one of my favourite musicals, A Chorus Line. We're now inside and we're talking to Anita Louise Coombe who plays Cassie. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. It's one of the most iconic roles in musical theatre. How does it feel to be playing such a role? A dream come true, really. Mm -hmm. So the role of Cassie, she is a sort of more mature performer than all of the other people standing on the line. And she is somebody who has had uh, fame and experience and you know all the accolade that comes with playing lead roles. But she has come to this audition on this particular day basically asking for a job because she hasn't worked and she needs to work and she needs to work in the area that she knows best and the area that she should be working so it's great. Well you've had an amazing experience and such a fantastic career do you think that your career oh, is oh. reflected in the character of Cassie that you're playing? Most definitely I've had a varied career you know I've done a lot of diverse theatre and I've, I've lived in London now for 20 years mm. Do you think it is different being 
a woman in the musical theatre industry or the theatre industry than it is being a man. Yes, I do. Maybe it's changing a little bit now. There's shows like Mamma Mia where there's fantastic female roles. But yeah, you know, there's the pressure also of getting older in the industry. Have you got any advice for any young girls that may be in the audience today and would love to be on stage and how would they go about doing it? Well, I, I think, you know, I'm looking back on my training and my career and in all honesty, I worked diligently and very, very hard. I would say most definitely work hard, look at what your, be realistic about what your talent is and really work on it. And I would just say, you know, look at your dreams, focus on them and see them and work towards them. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's a wonderful show. Thank you very much. who plays Connie Wong. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Can you please tell us a bit about the character you play? Yeah, definitely. Um, so my character was based on the life of Bayok Lee. And so basically her life is she's American born, but she's from an Asian background. Basically her life, of her story is about trying to make it in American musical theatre as a woman with an Asian background. And she did really well and she's still very well known throughout the industry in New York. Does the character you play reflect your life at all? A little bit in terms of, I guess, me myself being Australian Asian. I've been raised in a way that sometimes in Australian society might not be understood. And also within musical theatre, trying to find an area where I could be cast. Either do I only get cast as an ethnic? So it is hard to find that balance of, you know, what do I go for and, and what area I fit in uh, casting-wise. And do you think it's harder for you to find good roles because of this? or my do background? You, yeah. Definitely. Sometimes it is because I get looked at for my Asian background, instead of being looked at, well, she's just a female musical theatre performer that can sing, dance and act, let's just put her in that role. I would love to, in the future, be cast fully on just the fact that I'm a woman that can sing, dance and act to the the role that is needed, but not because of my ethnic background. Just... Absolutely, and maybe even gender doesn't matter yes, either. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that would be wonderful. It's just about talent and we'll just get whoever we, yeah. you know, who's the best for the role to, pl to play it. Yeah, and that's why sometimes with these more fantastical musicals that are coming around, like Wicked and maybe some of even the Disney kind of ones, um, they it doesn't matter if you're male or female, it, it, it is just creating some fantasy character and and, and that's a lot of fun and it'd be nice to see more of them come around. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much and you're fabulous you. on the show and good luck. Thank you very much. Lovely Thank to meet you. you. Thanks for joining us. And remember to check out our website, inspirationalwomen.tv, to like us on Facebook and check out our special feature in Dare magazine online. And then remember, until next time, be inspired.